on episode 217 of The Anxious Truth, we're going to do 10 more of the most frequently asked questions about anxiety and anxiety recovery. So let's get to it. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to The Anxious Truth. This is podcast episode number 217, 217. We're recording at the end of July 2022. Uh, welcome. I am Drew Linsalata, creator and host of The Anxious Truth. This is the podcast that focuses on all things anxiety, anxiety disorders, and recovery. So welcome. If you're new here, welcome aboard. If you're a returning listener, welcome back. Um, today, we're going to do part two of our frequently asked questions. Uh, these are 20 of the most frequently asked questions about anxiety and anxiety recovery that I encounter in my many years in this community and doing this work that I do. Last week in episode 216, we did the first 10. So go back and listen to that if you have not. And today in 217, we're going to do the second 10. Uh, the show notes for these two episodes are quite detailed. So you can find the show notes for this episode at theanxioustruth.com slash 217. And I have included in there all the links to all the other resources and podcast episodes that I'll talk about here. So go to theanxioustruth.com slash 217 and check that out. And while you're on my website, I would like to remind you that the Anxious Truth is more than just this podcast episode. There's 200 and somewhat other podcast episodes. There's a ton of free social media content. Uh, there's my free morning newsletter called The Anxious Morning. Uh, and there are three really excellent books on anxiety and anxiety recovery that I have written that are helping tens of thousands of people around the world. So while you're on theanxioustruth.com, check out all of those resources. They're good. Most of them are free. Go ahead and avail yourself of them. And if you are enjoying my work, and it's helping you in some way, and you would like to help me keep it free of sponsorships and advertising, all the ways to do that can be found at the anxious slash support. So check that out. Never required, always appreciated. So let's get into part two of our frequently asked questions. And we'll get right into it. We're going to do 10 today. So question one this week is, is recovery possible, even if you've suffered for many years? And the answer to that is, it sure is. This is a short answer. Many, many members of our community can turn things around even after years of dealing with disordered anxiety. For me, it was over 20, 25 years of my life on and off in three or four major episodes. Uh, so yeah, the amount of time that you have suffered with this, I'm not going to say it, it doesn't matter completely, but it is certainly not a reason why you could not get better. You can do that. Um, yes, you may build some habits, but at some point, the hole can only get so deep. And I think that's what people worry about. Like, oh, I keep digging a deeper and deeper hole. I've been digging for 20 years. So how am I ever going to crawl out of this hole? That's not the right way to, to um, visualize it. I like to say the hole can only get so deep once you are to the point where you're avoiding everything, you're housebound or stuck in one room, or you, you've got yourself down to eating only three foods because you're afraid or you know, you're super restricted, there's, o there's only so much restriction you can impose on yourself. So assume that the hole has gotten as deep as it has is it's ever going to get, you just start decorating and get comfortable in that hole, you personalize it, you hang artwork, like you put in a stereo system and listen to your favorite music while you're there. So it the hole doesn't get deeper, you just get more comfortable in it. That doesn't matter, you can turn this around, it doesn't matter how long you have suffered, I promise you can get better. I was 20 plus years, 25 plus years. I know people even longer than that that have dealt with this. I know one woman over 40 years, uh, and she has turned things around. She's well on the way to recovery. So yes, uh, in terms of resources, episode 124 of The Anxious Truth talks about that. So you can go check that out. So question number two today, what if I don't have panic attacks and I just feel anxious all day? So there's, there's two things that I really want to address in this question. First of all, there's a misconception that people that have panic attacks are somehow calm or not anxious between attacks. And that is 100% not true. Like people with panic disorder, I had panic disorder, I was anxious all day long, too. So if you're in that boat, and you don't have panic attacks, the first thing I want you to be aware of is that that's not necessarily a special condition. And it's not like people that do have panic attacks, have attacks and then are calm the rest of the day, it doesn't work that way. So don't don't feel bad about that. Now, being anxious all day can be the result of the, the same mechanism that drives things like panic disorder. You could start to learn to be anxious just because you're anxious. And the longer this goes on, that becomes part of the puzzle for a lot of people. Like, I'm anxious all day long. I can't figure out why. So now I start to become anxious about being anxious. That's one of those things. Or another reason why you might be anxious all day long 
And this starts to get into the realm of generalized anxiety or generalized anxiety disorder. A lot of people that have GAD are anxious all day long, but not everybody that's continually anxious has GAD. So really GAD is defined by excessive worry and focus on external things, the health of your family, your own health, doing good at work, not letting people down, taking care of everything, being perfect, being a people pleaser. Like those are things where we are trying to control the world uh, to an excessive degree. And that's sort of the hallmark of generalized anxiety disorder. It's based on that sort of stuff. And then it gets off the rails and gets carried away. So people with GAD can have a general background anxiety that lasts all day long too. So there could be that. And then you could also begin to just be anxious about being anxious because you can't solve the anxiety problem. So it's not that this is a special thing or it can't be fixed. Uh, sometimes if you're in, the, in that GAD camp, you got to look at some of the underlying things that go with that. Things like excessive worry, overthinking, overplanning, perfectionism, people pleasing, things that can drive anxiety state, but that you think are could be good things about your personality, you got to look at that. So I talked about this in episode 119, I had Dave Carbonell on and we talked about uh, generalized anxiety disorder and episode 148 of the podcast uh, covers this. But if you're anxious all day long, you don't have panic attacks, it's okay, you can still get better, I promise. So question three, how can I drive during a panic attack or anxiety spike, it's not safe. So this one, uh, I did two podcast episodes that specifically talk about this podcast episode number 55, podcast episode number 105, were specifically about driving and driving anxiety. So there's an assertion here that people will make that when you are in a high anxiety state, state or a state of panic, that you literally lose control and have no agency anymore like some external force rolls in and possesses you and makes you do things or prevents you from doing things. This is a thing that you really have to start to challenge. Has that ever been true? Now, you are most certainly afraid, you're very uncomfortable. But the choices that we make in those moments in an attempt to alleviate that fear and escape from the discomfort are not involuntary. So when talking about is it safe to drive during a panic attack, you have to realize that Yes, a rapid heartbeat during panic is involuntary. You can't control that. Yes, maybe feeling a little short of breath is involuntary. Yes, feeling nauseous is involuntary. Feeling a little depersonalized is involuntary. That's all true. But the things that we do to add fuel to that fear fire, OMG, OMG, calling for help, trying desperately to get to a safe place, trying to run away from it, those are voluntary. Those are choices that we make. So you can't control how you're going to feel, but we do have some agency in what we do about that. And you have to realize that the uncontrollable feeling or the idea that you will completely lose control of your, of your mind and your body or that you do lose control of your mind and body is really you know what you're doing and you know what that activity looks like and you're calling that uncontrollable. But really, we do have choice. We are making choices to do those things. So it's important to consider that because that sort of challenges the narrative that says it's not safe to drive because I lose control. Well, no, you choose to help to fuel a frantic state in your frantic effort to try and get away from the fear. But there is choice there and there is agency. That's really important when you talk about driving. And I would urge you to consider another thing. And that is all the times that you have been anxious behind the wheel or experienced full-blown panic behind the wheel and you have run home with that car or pulled over immediately or got off the highway or the motorway, in all of those situations, you are surprisingly adept at maneuvering your vehicle, even though you're insisting that you can't and you must stop maneuvering the vehicle. So sometimes we have to insert a little bit of an objectivity here, take two steps backward from that emotional reaction of, oh my God, I'm out of control, it's horrible, and really look at the facts. Like, am I out of control or am I just worried that I will be? And have I ever even shown any sign of being unable to control my vehicle. Now, I'm not saying that driving with a panic attack is comfortable or easy in any way, shape, or form, and it's okay to pull over and let it pass. It's totally okay. But you got to start to challenge that narrative. But in the end, you're the, only ones that gets, you're the only one that gets to decide whether you should drive or not. I can't tell you, yes, go ahead and drive. I can tell you to start to really try and think objectively about the way you're evaluating that and let reality be a bit of a guide. But I cannot tell you, no, go ahead and drive. Only you can determine that. Again, t take a listen to podcast episodes 55 and 105, and maybe that, those will help. So let's go on to our next question. Question five. What if you have a real medical condition? Okay, this is, is unfortunately common. Human beings have medical conditions all the time. More than one thing can be true at a time. 
So when this happens, you have to remember that you have an actual medical or health issue and can also be caught in the grips caught in the grips of disordered anxiety. Those two things will get glued together and you you will stick them together and think that they are one big giant ball of fear. But really, they are not. So there's two things in the face of a health challenge or a medical condition, that medical condition can cause actual restrictions, lifestyle restrictions, but it can also cause fear, uncertainty, vulnerability, um, anxiety, worry, normal things like human beings that are having health problems will normally experience those states. But then there's the extra state on top of that. So that's the medical condition itself and the normal human reaction to that. And then there's the disordered part that comes on top of that, which is now I am going to excessively worry beyond what is actually helpful about my health condition. I'm going to try to make predictions. I'm going to write giant horror story screenplays in my head about what might happen, even though it's not happening now. I'm going to ruminate and worry and ruminate and worry and research and Google. And I'm going to try to solve this problem in my head. But you can't. That's the part that you don't have to do. That part is not required. That part is actually not helping you in any way. It's actually kind of hurting you in terms of mental health. Right? So you have to recognize those two things. Oh, I'm, I'm worried right now. I'm concerned. I'm afraid. I feel uncertain and vulnerable because of this medical condition. Okay, that's okay. And that sucks. And my heart goes out to you. But that's part of being human. But the part where you latch onto it and spend 24 hours a day every waking moment trying to solve this problem and writing stories about it in your head, that's not needed. And then in many cases, your anxiety level goes up because you're doing that. And then you're anxious because you're anxious. So it's important to step back again, try to insert a little objectivity and say, Oh, I see what's going on here. I don't have to say, well, I have a health condition and it sends my anxiety through the roof. No, I have a health condition. And that makes me feel certain things. And then I am adding on top of that with some of my habits that I think are safety or protection for me. And I can recognize that and begin to tease that apart and start to work on those other habits. So that's my answer to what if I have a real medical condition, people will often say like, well, I, I have a real medical condition. So all bets are off too bad, like I'm going to have to be an anxious mess. No, that's not true. Now I did an episode of the podcast with my friend Jessica Seidner. Uh, Jessica doesn't have uh, anxiety disorders like like we are aware. But we did a great episode together where she talked about having to deal with the increased anxiety of breast cancer diagnosis, which came right on the heels of losing her husband. So she had a lot going on, medical condition and a huge life loss. Uh, and her anxiety went up because it normally did. And we talked about how she had to work through that. That might be helpful. I also did an Instagram live on this topic, oh, probably a year and a half or two years ago. So again, if you go to the show notes for this episode, theanxioustruth.com slash 217, under this uh, question, you'll see that link to Instagram. So next question, we are on to question number six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Okay, so we're on to question, I think, five or six. How do you accept anxiety or surrender to it? So this is a question I get every day. And this question is really like other other statements in code. This question is really, it's super scary to surrender. So please tell me how to do it without being afraid or uncomfortable. Right? So th there is no way to do this without being afraid or uncomfortable. And I know that's a, a glib answer, a brutal answer. It's, it sounds like a cold answer, but we need to confront these things. It doesn't help us to try desperately to, to, to make it easier or fluffier. It doesn't work that way. So you also have to recognize that when you ask the question, but how am I supposed to accept this or surrender to it? What you're really doing is insisting that you must continue to resist it. But why? Why do you think you have to continue to resist it? So if you are in this camp right now where you want to keep asking, but I don't understand how I'm supposed to surrender, or how I'm supposed to accept it, what you're really telling me is, number one, I don't want to be afraid, which I, I understand. I'm not picking on you for that. Nobody wants to be afraid. And number two, no, no, no. I, I, how am I supposed to? I can't. If I drop all this resistance, then it's going to come and get me. And my answer is yes, correct. So how can I accept or surrender really is an insistence that you're not supposed to accept or surrender because you have to continue to fight it and resist it because if you don't, you won't be safe. And if you want one big step that you can take toward acceptance and surrender is to face the harsh, brutal, cold reality that all of the things that you are doing to resist it, stop it, make it go away, all your rituals and safety behaviors and escape behaviors, 
are literally doing nothing. I'm going to leave a big pregnant pause there. Literally doing nothing. No amount of tapping your cheeks, sniffing oils, drinking cold water, popping mints, calling for help, snapping rubber bands, chanting, counting backwards from 100. None of those things is actually doing anything because that danger has never actually existed. So in terms of how can I accept and surrender, I will say, if I walked up to you and said, I am so tired from having to hold up the moon all the time, but, but I can't stop holding up the moon or it will fall to the ground. You would look at me and say, no, no, you can stop holding up the moon because you've never actually been holding up the moon. It, it doesn't fall to the ground. It's okay. You can let go. Same thing applies here. So the, the, the thought that you can't possibly accept anxiety or surrender it, and by the way, acceptance doesn't mean liking it. Do not get confused. You can still hate it. You can still want it to not happen. That's all normal, and you can't control That's human. You're allowed to be human. Accepting doesn't mean liking it. But accepting and surrendering means you will drop all of those safety behaviors, all of those resisting behaviors, because you must face the realization that they are literally doing nothing. They have no impact on your safety at all. They're just designed to make you feel different. But feeling different isn't safer at all because you were never in actually danger from feeling anxious, right? So you're going to have to confront the reality behind that question, but how am I supposed to surrender or accept? Well, look what those questions really mean. So next question is, what exposures can I do to get ready for dot, dot, dot? Pick an event, a wedding, a concert, a family vacation, something. And so in the end, this is a simpler answer. You have to remember what exposures are there for. People think, or, or they get confused and they think, well, I'm learning to drive on the highway again. I'm learning to go shopping again. I'm learning to stay home alone again. You're actually not learning to do anything. The only thing that you're learning to do, which is portable across situations and challenges and contexts, is you're learning how to get better at experiencing anxiety and fear. So we only do exposures, do specific things like drive or go for a walk or stay home alone or eat a food that you're afraid of, so that it will trigger that anxiety. We were intentionally triggering anxiety, fear, and comfort, discomfort, uncertainty, all of those things. We're intentionally triggering them so that you can practice feeling them and moving through them in a new way a more productive way that ultimately teaches you that you don't have to save yourself from them. So if the exposure is not to the, the event or the task or the place or the food or whatever, the exposure is to the feelings, then every exposure is an exposure that works for other things, right? So if you're getting ready to go to, for instance, you're going to a concert, oh, I got tickets to a concert. How can I expose myself to that? I mean, yes, can you do things that sort of mimic a concert? Yeah, that doesn't hurt in any way. But remember, you're only you're not afraid of the concert, you're afraid of how you will feel at the concert. So if you want to take a cruise around the world, get better at staying home alone for two hours. That's what I tell people all the time. If you want to go back to work, then get better at walking around your block. Because you are really in the end, you're learning a new way to, to relate to anxiety across all contexts. And if you can adopt this, then you don't have to worry about specific exposures for every single thing you might have to do in your life. Life gets a lot simpler that way. And your recovery starts to become a little wider and more durable. So it's really important. Like, think about that. I'm only doing these things because they trigger my anxiety. The anxiety, the fear, that's the exposure, not the task or the place. So let's move on to question 8, 9, 10. I don't know which one I write. I think we're on 7 right now. Uh, this question is, well, does this method work if I have trauma too? So first of all, I always have to say, this is not a method. Like I'm not teaching one. This isn't the Drew method. It's definitely not my method. I didn't invent any of this. These are just the principles of a cognitive behavioral approach to anxiety disorders. So there are parallels between anxiety disorder recovery and trauma resolution. That's 100% true. A lot of things will look the same. If you're working with a trauma resolution specialist, some of the things that you would hear would sound a lot like the things that I talk about but they're not exactly the same. And the issue here is, let's assume that you do have a traumatic background and you've experienced some traumatic events in your life. And maybe that, that trauma did spawn your anxiety disorder. That can happen. But then what I always say is that one problem, the trauma, has now become two problems. You have trauma and an anxiety disorder, right? So you have to realize that. It doesn't mean 
that the anxiety disorder doesn't count because it's only the trauma. If you had one problem, now you have two. That's okay, though. Don't freak out. You can successfully deal with both of those issues. A lot of people do, right? A lot of people do that work on both fronts. But traumatic experiences do not mean that the anxiety disorder doesn't count. Like, so some people are under that assumption that like, well, this all sounds well and good, but I have trauma. So what you're saying doesn't apply to me. Okay, you may have trauma. And I, I'm very sorry for the things that you've lived through. That's possible. But in the end, if you have learned to be afraid of your own heartbeat, or your own breath, or you have learned to be afraid of, you know, depersonalization or jelly legs, and you refuse to go out of the house, or you are convinced that you have some sort of health problem, and you will only eat four foods as a result, maybe there was some trauma that that spawned that. But but knowing about that trauma doesn't help you become less afraid of your own heartbeat. Now you're afraid of multiple things. So maybe you were having, you know, you were afraid of the past experience, but now you're also afraid of yourself. So you have to do both of the things, bo both of them. You have two problems, you can solve them both. So traumatic experience can be a roadblock 100% to executing the recovery plan that we're always talking about here. It's 100% true. If you have lived experiences that teach you that you are always unsafe, the world is dangerous, you are weak, you're not capable, you're stupid, you're not worthy of being better. Trauma can do that to you. And if you have those beliefs about yourself because of your past experiences, that can 100% present a roadblock to doing the work that I always talk about. I have to acknowledge that. And I always will. Always will. I'm never going to invalidate that. So in that situation, you're going to have to work on that too, right? You'll have to work on that. It's, it's kind of hard. And, and this is different for everybody, right? There's no set answer to this. On the other side, so in that situation, you may find that you have to do a little bit of work on yourself before you can actually effectively do this recovery work that I'm talking about. For some other people, they find that their anxiety disorder is so bad that they're so racked with panic and irrational fear that they can't really do the trauma work until they put out this fire. So some people have to do this first and then go back to the past and do that work. Some people can do it at the same time. It's individual. It depends. So there's no set answer to this. But I can definitely tell you that you can recover from both trauma and anxiety. And the things that I'm writing about, which are really geared toward the anxiety recovery, can be effective while you do that. It's just a very individual situation. But please don't feel that since you have lived a traumatic background, you can't get better. That's not true. That's not fair. And I understand why you might think that, but, but it's not true. You can get better. It's not easy. But, but there's hope for you too, I promise. So last few questions. This is a really common one. I'm accepting. Why am I still anxious? So I might argue that if you are asking why you are still anxious, then you're not actually accepting. We can't qualify our acceptance. I'm accepting, but I'm accepting this, but I also want it gone. Well, you can't have both of those things. Think about that for a second. I know it sounds a little bit glib and a little silly, but think about it. There's truth in there. I'm accepting this, but I also don't want to accept it, and I'm not really accepting it. I know you want your anxiety to go away. But accepting and doing all the things we talk about, it's not a recipe for banishing it, right? If that's why you're doing this, like you, you are hoping that if you do the Claire Weeks acceptance or the Drew uh, surrender or the Josh Fletcher willful tolerance, if I do this, then it will stop. You're, you're trying to skip the part where you have to experience the anxiety and use it as a classroom. It's super important. So if you're trying to skip that and you're just hoping that, okay, I accept, wait a minute, how come it hasn't gone away? You're missing the whole process. And you're going to wind up disappointed, frustrated and, and do and asking this question, I don't understand, I'm accepting why isn't it gone away. So expectations are important. Understanding the concepts of recovery, why are you accepting? Is that the whole thing? Or is it just part of it? That's important. Aiming at the right target is important. So in this situation, I did uh, episode 192 of the podcast, which is linked in the show notes here, go listen to that that will probably help you. And this is related to question number nine, which is, I'm doing my exposures, but it's not working. This is where you think you're doing, I'm doing all the things I'm doing exposures, but not working. Why? And there's a couple of common explanations for this. Number one would be, uh, we'll ask you a couple of questions. And this is right out of the show notes. Are you trying to do exposures without being too afraid? Are you trying to do your exposures without triggering high anxiety or panic? Are you only doing exposures now and then when you're forced to or when you're having a good day? Are you doing exposures while also using all of your soothing and, co and coping tools to calm you down if it gets uncomfortable? These are all red flags as to why exposure might not be working. 
So remember what I said a couple of questions before the point of the exposure is not doing the task. The point of the exposure is experiencing the, the fear, the anxiety, the discomfort, you want that you need that. If you're trying to find ways to do your exposure tasks without feeling that or minimizing it or soothing it or calming it or making it easier, then don't do the exposure. There's no point in it. Because you're not you're not learning to drive again, you're learning how to get better at experiencing anxiety. So this is one of the main reasons why people will say my exposures aren't working. Well, okay, but you're not really doing exposure in some cases, very common mistake. Uh, the other thing would be that you know that you're supposed to experience that experience panic, but you are still hanging on to those like escape behaviors and those rituals. So some people get close to like real exposure, I would say real exposure, but most effective exposure, but they still hang on to like, well, there's a line that I just can't cross with anxiety and panic. And when I get close to that line, I will break out all of my, my coping skills. And I will break out my, my safety skills and my make it go away skills. And that's the response prevention part. So we've talked about exposure and response prevention, ERP, which is very commonly used in the OCD community, you hear ERP in that community all the time. But really, even for all of the anxiety disorders, exposure is always ERP. So doing the things, you're doing the things you're intentionally triggering this comfort, and you're doing that without using your old responses, your safety responses and soothing responses you're preventing those responses. So one of the reasons why another re another key reason why exposure might not be working air quotes for you is first of all, what does working mean? It doesn't mean make it go away. Remember, it means teaching you how to get better at being anxious. Uh, but why do you think it's not working? Well, one of the reasons is doing the exposure without doing the response prevention. I'm out there driving on the highway, but I've got my mints and my cold water and I got my radio on and I'm calling and I'm talking to my friend or I bring my husband or my girlfriend with me that that's one good reason why it might not be actually working, right? So if you go to the anxious truth.com and just search for the word exposure, you'll see quite a few podcast episodes where we talk about this in more detail. And then question 10 final question for the day. This is a big one. How do I deal with a setback? So this is such a this question I hear every single day. And the word setback, I almost want stricken from the vocabulary. Many times when people are in the recovery process, and they feel like they're doing great, because they're not experiencing anxiety or panic, like they're feeling good. That's, that's awesome. We want everybody to feel good. I want you to feel good too, right? I want you to have good days. We all want to have good days. Everybody deserves a good day. So when you start to string good days together, and you're feeling pretty good, and it's been a while since you had a panic attack, or it's been a while since you had those scary thoughts, or it's been a while since you've had a really anxious day, and then you have an anxious day, or the thoughts come back, or you have a big panic attack one night, a lot of people will say, Oh, it's a setback. That's not a setback. That's literally not a setback, right? If the core principle of recovery is to learn that anxiety and panic are not emergencies, then how is feeling that a setback? It's no longer an emergency. You are trying to learn that it's not an emergency. We do not declare it a special event. We don't retreat from it. So setback is usually a red flag word. And it indicates that you are still insisting that the only successful recovery is one you where you will never ever feel anxious or panicky ever again. And if you are trying to recover to that degree, where you never you can guarantee that you never panic or never have another scary thought in your life, you're going to be really disappointed and frustrated. So setback is not feeling things. If you haven't felt anxious for two weeks, and then today you feel anxious, well, your job today is to move through those feelings and practice being better at being anxious. That's not a setback. That's just life happening. And that's an opportunity to get even better. Like, we really want to, we get to the end of the road of recovery when we don't care if we're anxious or not. And I know that if you're in the thick of it right now, you are thinking that is an insane statement, but that is truly where you are headed with this. That is when the war is over. So if every time you experience anxiety, you yell setback, and want to know what do I do with the setback, you're kind of missing the point and you're not being fair to yourself. Okay. So the only true thing that I might call setback is set, setback is also is really what happens when we say up oh, all bets are off, and I'm going to return to my old rituals, I'm going to go back to my figuring it out, trying to fight it, trying to resist it, hiding from it, going back to my compulses, my, my compulsions, like that might be setback. Yes, if you start to revert to those old habits, I'll call that a setback with you. 
but how you feel and what you think is not the setback. But even if you do start to revert to those old habits, as soon as you wave the setback flag and want advice, just remember, oh, wait, I have to start doing what I was doing before. No problem. That happens to everybody. Move forward again. So if anxiety returns after some time, right out of the show notes here, your job is not to wring your hands and try to figure out why and how to stop it and, and declare disaster. Your job is to surf through it, move through it, like you presumably did as part of the progress that you said you had made. So I did do an episode on this early on in 2015 of the podcast, episode 14 talks about the, the nonlinear nature of recovery and goes over setbacks. But I know setback is a thing that we talk about all the time in this community. Hopefully this helps. And that is it. Those are our second 10 frequently asked questions about anxiety and anxiety recovery. Uh, we are done with episode 217. If you have not heard 216, go ahead and listen because those are the first 10 questions. You know we're done because Somebody told me that music. Anyway, I will play you out as usual with uh, Afterglow by Ben Drake. You can find Ben and his music at bendrakemusic.com. Go check him out. Tell him I said hi. Uh, I will ask you a favor. If you are listening to the podcast on iTunes, on uh, Apple Podcasts or Spotify or some platform that lets you rate and review, uh, please leave a five-star rating and maybe take a second to write a review because it helps other people find the podcast. If you're listening on YouTube, sorry there's no video this week, but if you're listening on YouTube, like the video, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment. You know the deal. I appreciate you guys coming by all the time, spending time with me, giving me your attention. Hopefully I'm able to help you. I'm doing the best I can. I'm hoping it's working out for you. Um, I'll be back next week. We're going to do it again. I don't know what I'm going to be talking about, but I will be here. And as always, remember, this is the way. You got the feeling that you're gonna win